marvelous show that I have really, really looked forward to talking to. This gentleman needs no introduction whatsoever. His name is Preston Pish. He is with the TIP podcast, one of my favorites. Preston, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. George, such a pleasure to be here, bud. All right, so... I just got done listening to one of your podcasts with Stig back in March when we'll call it the Cervezas sickness was really coming into play. The markets, I think, had just crashed, but they, you know, back in February, they're going to all these all time highs when we were seeing what was going on in China. I know you spoke with our mutual friend, Eric Townsend from Macro Voices, who was really way, way, way ahead of the game on this one. And you talked to Stig about your first impressions of what you saw going on in Wuhan. Can, can you go over that? Because now I'm in Florida right now, and I, I haven't been back to the United States really for about a year, and I'm just on my way to the Caribbean. But it, it's very uh, bizarre, I think is the right word, here in Florida. I'm sure people have read the news. They're getting all of these cases. And no matter how much you buy into the 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 virus the bottom line is it's really affecting human behavior behavior and i'm seeing it just out walking around i I've, it's like a sci-fi movie but can you give us your insights from a military standpoint on what you saw in wuhan because i think it could be maybe playing again here in the united states if we have a second wave you know i i think something that you're bringing up there before i address your question the thing that you're talking about that i think so few people think about from a business standpoint is habits and when companies like Target, Walmart, all these big, these big box consumer goods type companies, the thing they all focus on is buying habits. And when those buying habits change, there's the, a precarious situation and there's an opportunity for businesses that can, that can take advantage of that change in the buying habit. I think what we've seen since COVID really kind of went full force there at the end of the first quarter, starting into the second quarter of 2020, was just a massive, unprecedented, biggest change in buying habits that I would tell you the world has ever seen. And I think that as COVID really never officially went away, and here we are getting ready to step into the third quarter, um, I, I think after you've had three months, four months of that type of situation to play out, people's buying habits are completely different. They're not going out to the restaurants like they were going out to before. They're not doing, they're not going to church like they used to. They're not doing all these things that were very common in their, their daily activities and they're spending less. They're, they're paying down their credit cards when they got stimulus checks. They're doing all these things that were not just in the habit loop of what they were doing in the past. And, and I'll tell you right now, central banks, they need people spending money, Right. Like, you know better than anybody, they need that, they need people spending money and they're kind of doing, and consumers, at least here in the United States, are doing a little bit opposite of that. But to, to answer your question, I was, like Eric Townsend, I was looking at the numbers, just the global, uh, the global macro numbers that you're, you're constantly seeing, the derivatives market and things like that. And then in, in January and February, the numbers in China started looking crazy. They, they looked way different than anything we'd ever seen. And um, I reached out to Eric and I said, Eric, you got to come on the show because this does not look like anything I've ever seen before. He was another person on Twitter who was saying something similar. And I mean, we were getting at the time we were getting laughed at people saying we were raising fear and, and fear mongers and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, I was just I'm a numbers guy and I was looking at the numbers. And then I started following different accounts on Twitter and I was seeing these, these videos that were coming out of China. And I mean, they looked like a military chemical biological training exercise with people in full mass and, and the whole deal. And they're spraying down the roads and, and some of these videos were slipping under the firewall coming out of China. And I was just, I was looking at it and I say, this is nothing like we've ever seen before. And I was kind of suspecting it was going to get a little bit crazy. And to be honest with you, it's even crazier than what I was thinking back then. And I thought, I thought it was going to be very bad back then. So, yeah. And, and, and can you go over just your, your brief history in the military so people can put that into context? It's not like you just have, have seen a couple TV shows. I mean, you were in the army. I mean, you've seen this in real life. So, so you know what yeah. these things look like. 
Yeah. So, you know, I, I went to a military academy. I went to West Point right out of high school. And, you know, your first year there, one of the, one of the things they do is they put you through a gas chamber. And so mm-hmm. you have to put a gas mask on, you have to go in there, then you have to lift the gas mask off. You got to breathe in the CS gas. You got to go through all those kind of things. And, and that's part of your training regimen, uh, in the military is biological chemical chemical warfare is to have a gas mask, how to go through all the procedures, wearing the, wearing the equipment, going mop three, mop four, whatever it might be. And so for me, when I'm looking at these videos coming out of China and I'm seeing them all geared up with the everybody, not just one person, but like everybody is geared up into this biological equipment. I'm, I was saying, this is not your standard flu. This is not your standard, like, you know, cold, this is something that's yeah. very serious that, uh, to me looked like a military exercise at the, at the time back then. Yeah. And during this podcast that I'm referring to w- with you and Stig going back and forth, you kind of transitioned that thought into what you were doing with your own portfolio with just going pretty much to, to Bitcoin and cash because of what you thought the response from the central banks would be. So can you walk us through kind of what you did, what your thought process was back then, uh, that's March, and then how, if you've changed that thought process uh, today, or if you're seeing even more of what you made uh, or what made you make those decisions back then playing out right now? So anybody who hears that probably thinks that, you know, I, I'm not like a standard kind of investor or whatever. And it's, it's probably very far from the truth because I am, I'm a hardcore Warren Buffett style investor, value investor. Um, my, my approach to investing has changed through the years, just through doing hundreds of episodes and talking to really brilliant minds on our podcast. And the only thing that I tell you that's really changed about my, the way that I invest is I've actually incorporated macro into my investing philosophy where before I was just a hardcore value investor that followed the principles of Ben Graham, Warren Buffett, and, and folks like that. And so through the way that I invest, I'm, I'm, like you, George, I'm looking for companies that are kicking off a lot of free cash flows that um, are undervalued in the marketplace. You know, if it's kicking off $10 of free cash flow, I'm, I'm out there trying to buy that company for 50 bucks or, you know, $100 or something like that so that I can lock in a, a 10% gain or something like that. That's how I'm, that's how I'm trying to value a business. And what got, what really got hard for me in the last three or four years is we've seen the market get bid to levels that are just unprecedented. And when you're doing these valuations and you're looking at, well, how's the market price today? And if you look at the S and P 500, well, it's, it's priced at like a 2% return based on the, the current market capitalization. So I had to start asking myself, why, why is the market continuing to be bid at 3% or 2% levels? It's such a high market cap. What's causing this? And that's where I started digging into macro and trying to understand people like Ray Dalio. How do they invest? How does a guy like Stan Drunken Miller invest? You're a big fan of Jim Rogers. How do those guys invest? And what it really led me to was a momentum style of investing. And what I found through the years of studying all these great billionaire type investors is you've got value investors and then you have really kind of momentum investors and macro investors. And it's not that one, one strategy works while the other one doesn't. I, I personally believe that the two strategies can be very complementary of each other where, let me give you an example. Let's say I find a company that's outstanding from a fundamental basis, meaning the valuation on it when I'm looking at the future free cash flows of the business and the current market price that it's selling for on the open market is good. Um, just because you have good, good fundamentals doesn't mean that the thing's not going to continue to go down for the next year. Like it might continue to get punished for another year before it basically hits a bottom and then starts coming back to that intrinsic value or that valuation that you think it's worth that the market's not seeing. So the way I've amended my investing approach through the years is I'm looking for those good fundamental Warren Buffett, Ben Graham type investments. But at the same time, I'm trying to find something that has a good momentum trend, the, the, uh, Stan drunken Miller style investment. And so when I started studying that approach, when I started studying momentum, what I found is 
volatility is really important to understand in the price action because it's momentum is pretty much you're looking at the price action of of the stock. And so when you look at a company, let's just say let's just take the S and P 500, like the volatility on the S and P 500, let's just call it 10 percent or 12 percent, somewhere in that range. So not a ton of volatility. If you go and look at something on, and that would be an annual basis volatility. If I'm looking at something like Tesla, the volatility on that is 50 percent, 60 percent, something extremely high. So if you're trying to use a momentum strategy on something that has just insane volatility like that, it can be really tricky because what you're doing on a momentum strategy is you're looking at uh, a, a trend in the price and that 60% for, vol- for Tesla would be like the 60% volatility range or for the S&P 500 to be a 12% volatility range and that it's moving. When it breaks outside of that, that range that it typically trades within, then you know maybe something's different. And so what I've done through the years is I've, ad- I've adjusted my approach where I'm looking for those good Buffett-style uh, fundamental great valuation type companies, but then I'm also trying to marry it up with something that has a positive momentum trend based on the price action and the volatility of that. And so uh, going is, back to your- Is that the tool that you were referring to in that podcast yes. when you were talking about Stig on your website? That sounded yes. very fascinating. Yes. So this is, so when I was looking at the market back and this gets to your original question, which is how, how was I able to step out of the market back, uh, when it, when it dropped? Well, I'm looking at the S and P 500. I'm looking at the NASDAQ. I'm looking at the the Russell 2000, which are really big indexes that have a tighter volatility range. And so when the price action on those particular indexes had been going up for, years. They were, they've been green on, on my momentum tool for years. And I saw them break that momentum trend because they stepped outside of that, that long-term volatility that, that I track very closely. And when they all stepped out of that, and then I'm looking at companies like Apple and, and, you know, all the uh, FANG stocks and they all broke, they all turned red on that momentum. I said, this is different liquidated positions. And I mean, what's nice is if you're dealing with something with a low volatility, call it the Russell 2000 and you're at like a 10% volatility trough for the momentum. I was able to step out of that, miss the, miss the substantial downside that a lot of that went down 30% or whatever it was. And then I was also able to see when it turned back green again, because it turned back green again, pretty quickly for a lot of them, especially the NASDAQ. I think it was only in a in a negative momentum status for, oh my God, it was probably 10 days was, was all the longer. And then it shot straight back up into the green and it's still green to this day on the momentum. So, um, some, some interesting ways to kind of adapt considering the, the circumstances we're dealing with, because like you and I talked about a week ago, um, the momentum or I'm sorry, the, the, the central bankers are going to stop at nothing. Yeah. Right. They, they're going to just keep on printing. So, for a person to say, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines of my cash and they just keep printing and printing and printing. And they're just, the, the markets are not free and open. Anybody who tells you that they're free and open right now, in my humble opinion, are, are kidding themselves. So how do you play it if it's all coming down to policy decisions? And right now the, the policy decision of choice is more quantitative easing, which gets pumped straight into the bond market, which then has this trickle down effect into the equity market, at least for Highly capitalized yeah, or companies. Stimulus just going right into the economy. <laughs> yeah, it's going straight into asset prices. So you got, and you're well aware of this too, George. Is you, they're they're pumping all this liquidity into the system, and everyone's saying, "Well, where's the CPI? Where's the inflation? Well, the inflation's in the asset prices. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's getting bid. The bond market has been bid since 1981 because the central bank step in and manipulate interest rates. And now since 2008, 2009, they've done nothing but actually step in and and swap the cash for those bonds. And so they're, they're just straight up bidding the price of the bond market up, which makes the yields drop down because they're inversely correlated. And you, that there you have it. So until the policy changes and they start inserting that liquidity into the masses through universal basic income, um, you're going to continue to see more of the same in the, in the financial asset market as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Preston, what do you think about 
this, the M2 money supply, since they started quantitative easing, has gone, it's gone up substantially. But since they've started these most recent programs since March, I mean, it's gone parabolic, it's straight up. And that's M2. So although there's not a, a direct causal effect with quantitative easing when the Fed does it because they're just printing bank reserves, that has to be, that has to somehow there needs to be a transfer mechanism into the real economy, typically through the banking system or if the, the government spends it into existence. But so, but we've seen M2 go just straight up, while at the same time we see velocity just go just straight jump. down yeah. at pretty much the exact same rate. So I, I was talking to Lynn Alden about this the other day, and her theory is that the, the reason we see M2 go up so much and velocity going down is because all of that M2 is going into fewer and fewer and fewer bank accounts. And if you think about the rich getting richer and the wealth divide, that makes quite a bit of sense. But once these, uh, we'll call them fat cats for lack of a better word, once they start selling their shares to all the, the Davy Day traders and that, that M2 gets spread out and then it gets into the hands of people that are maybe spending that with more velocity, how do you see, have, have you thought about that? How does that play into your overall view of what may happen in the next year or three years from a standpoint of consumer price inflation in the United States? Or are you someone that I haven't really heard you talk about this too much? I'm assuming just because you own a lot of Bitcoin that you see inflation, but I know you own a lot of cash. So maybe you see asset deflation with consumer price uh, inflation. Uh, what's your view there? So I, I don't have a lot of cash. I have, um, you know, I have enough cash to to take care of the business expenses and the employees and things like that. But as far as holding that as, as a position, as a long-term, uh, you know, asset on my balance sheet, not at all. I mean, okay. not at all. Um, because I think it's, it's one of the worst places to be, but I still have to, you, you still have to make payroll for your businesses and things like that. But outside of that, that's, that's about it. Right. So everything's um, Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, I'm in Bitcoin. I have, uh, I have some equities, but it's nothing to really get too excited about. It's it's on the it's gold miners, it's gold ETFs, it's things like that. That um, so I have some diversity, but I'm I'm totally prepped in my holdings for uh, a a currency meltdown. Is is really kind of right. how I'm positioned. And going to going to your question, where you're talking about the M2 going up, so. Before 2008, 2009 timeframe, and even post 2008, 2009, there for a very long period of time, there was a lot of debt on the market that they're able to kind of swap this freshly printed cash for. And so it was this one for one. And as, as, the, as that debt was coming, coming off of the market, it was this one for one swap. So it didn't really seem like we were adding to the money supply until you get to a point where you start running out of things to buy and they're they're not to the point where they're running out of things to buy but uh you're getting there real fast um it was a couple months ago that um pow basically came out and said we need to we need the congress you need to spend more so i have more to buy it was basically kind of the, the essence of where he was getting and yeah. because you're getting to this point where now it's not a one-for-one -one swap it's it's every dollar i print is increasing the, the, the supply of money that's actually in the market. And so getting at your question, which is if they start going into the UBI route and they start not using QE as the primary mechanism to insert the cash, um, what you're going to, in my opinion, what you're going to see is you're going to start to see some type of CPI prices coming up. You're going to see like the price of meat going up. You're going to see the price of a lot of different commodities start going up in price and where this poses a major massive problem for the for the central banks is they cannot allow for interest rates to go up they just can't for for obvious reasons and when you have inflation coming up the the at least the the basket that they're measuring going up because we all know inflation's going up it's happening over in asset prices but for the tiny the 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 basket that they're using to measure inflation, when it starts materializing into that, 
all of a sudden now as a bond investor, you start pricing that in as a premium because all these all these bonds are priced as a premium above your inflation rate, right? If I can't, if inflation's 3%, well, I'm going to demand 3% plus whatever premium above that. And so if, if CPI starts going up and some of that starts getting priced into the bond market, now you, now you're really in this situation where the fed is manipulating things so much that it's just total 100% manipulated. And, and we're, I would argue you're, you're almost already there right now. It's just not going to be as nearly as manipulated as it's going to be in five or six months from now. I only see that trend getting way worse, way, way worse. Okay, so that that's great because that kind of bridges the gap between you know your value investing past and then how you kind of got to this Bitcoin position you have now. One of the things that you guys do so well on your podcast is you just really – get into the nitty gritty of the psychology and the framework for all of these incredibly successful investors. It's almost like a, a market wizards type of uh, look at it on, on a weekly basis. You guys have done this for so long. So I really want to get your opinion on something that, that I think a lot of investors do. And it's, it's a mistake in my opinion, but I'm not a pro like you are. So uh, what I see is a lot of people focusing like 99.9% .9 of their energy on trying to determine what stock is going to go up in price. And they, they don't even consider portfolio construction. They don't consider strategy. They don't consider, well, if it, it does go up, well, then what am I going to do? It reminds me of this uh, business broker I had one time in San Jose is one of those guys that just had a quick joke for everything, right? And I don't know how it came up, but we were, ta we were, we were talking about women. And he is probably a 60-year-old guy. You know, he'd been married for a long time. We were talking about younger gals. And he said, you know, for me, it would be just like a dog chasing a car, that even if I got one, I'd have no idea what to do with it. And it's the same thing, I think, with people in their, with their investments. If they do pick something that goes up 10x, it's like the dog chasing the car. Okay, now you got, what are you going to do with it? And they, they don't really think that through. So from your analysis of all these super famous and successful investors, how much of their bandwidth, their mental bandwidth, do they allocate to picking a stock? And then how much do they allocate to money management, portfolio construction, and strategy, and, and just the, the numbers and the math behind putting everything together? You know, most of the people that I study, and this might be my own bias for what I prefer based on my personality, because I think that's a huge part of it, is, is your personality and, and what works best with your personality. I'm a numbers guy. Like, my undergrad is in engineering, so, like, I love getting into the numbers of things. So, for me, the Buffett-style approach was really, um, you know, it, it just meshed well with my personality. So, when when I'm studying people that have a net worth over a billion dollars, I've, I have found that most of them are more math based. They're, they're, they're doing that. They're looking at the correlation across all their different picks. They're looking at what's the valuation of this company today. What do I think the, the total market share that they could, that they could capture would be. And is that where my selling point is? Like they're, they're doing all of that math. They're figuring out what that is. And then they're just making sure that they have a balanced position so they're not too heavily exposed to something with extreme volatility in one area, right? As I just talked about how much, you know, I'm exposed to Bitcoin, but this is, I would, I would tell you, I would tell you this is a very, very unique situation. I think that what we're seeing right now is something you're going to see once in your life. Uh, I think that's something we hit that neither you nor I have seen in our entire lifetime is what's about to play out here. So this is a little bit different. And I think you have to position yourself based on the history, the financial history that I've read. Um, you got to position yourself a little bit differently for situations like this than, than other situations. But as we would move through, let's just say we're through this, this event that I think is about to take place in the coming years. And we're 10, 15 years from now, you're going to find that I am a going back to the basics a very hardcore value investor that's really kind of looking for a balanced portfolio. I'm looking at the correlation of the various picks that I have and making sure that there's not too much correlation in one particular company. Um, 
and just kind of doing those fundamentals. So to kind of walk the dog on some of that, you know, you, you're, you're looking at a business, um, you know, if we were going to talk about the valuation of equities, you, the thing that I like to tell people when they're first learning how to, how to do valuations is think of one share of a business as if you could literally put it in the palm of your hand and that there's, you could look down at this small little business and there'd be little people in there actually working. And after one year, they, they'd walk out and they'd hand you $1 of profit. Okay. And I ask people the question, I say, how much would you be willing to buy that small little business for that you could literally put in the hand, palm of your hand that would give you $1 at the end of the year? You don't have to do any of the work that people are down there working in that small little business. What would you pay for that? And it's funny because a lot of the times people will say, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> I don't even know what, what? I don't, I have no idea how to answer that. And I said, well, if you're getting $1, like if you paid 10 bucks for it, that's a 10% return on an annual basis. So you can think of it in those terms. Or if you paid $5 for that business, you'd make a 20% return on an annual basis. And it's like this light bulb goes off in their head and they're like, oh, well, I never thought of it that way. And I said, well, when you go and you look at a, at a company, a publicly traded business, and it's trading for $10 a share, and you look up the earnings per share of the EPS and it's $1, it's exactly what I just described. Right. And, and it's this moment where you can see they're just like, whoa, well, I never thought that I could apply mathematics to this. And I mean, it's just algebra. I mean, it's just, it's not even algebra. It's just basic arithmetic. Right. But it's that moment where people are like, hold on, like, okay, I get it. Like, because one share of the business is no different than owning all of the shares of the business. It's a proportional thing. So, you know, one thing I wanted to add to that, my background as an entrepreneur, I retired in 2012, but I always try to look at it or explain it to people like buying a McDonald's franchise. Exactly. And those are about the size of the businesses that I used to be involved with. And I think I've got a huge edge because I used to do that so often. And I, when I would look at a business, whether it was a, a gas station or a little uh, sales and marketing business or a McDonald's franchise, I would never, ever ask myself, well, what do I think I can sell this McDonald's for in two weeks if I buy it right yeah. now? I mean, what? Like, like, who would ask that? You, you're not yeah. even, the only thing you're looking at is you're looking at the P&L and you're saying, okay, great. It's making, let's call it 200 grand a year. All right, how much debt am I going to have to take out? What's my debt servicing going to be? How much am I going to be left over with? How much am I going to have to put out of pocket to buy this thing? And can I grow it? Can I buy some more franchises? And then how can we, we scale up uh, the profits through economies or of scale or what have you? But your whole focus is on the P&L usually, and sometimes the balance sheet, depending on the business. But that's small. You usually don't have too much debt. So you're looking at the P&L. But you're not thinking about, well, what can I sell it for in a month? And then another thing, if let's just say it's making 100 grand a year, and in three years it's making 200 grand and or 250 or whatever. But let's just say because of interest rates going up or whatever happens – that you have a business broker come in and give you an appraisal on the business in three years, and it's an appraises for five thousand less than you paid for it, but it's making double yeah. in profit. Is that a terrible investment? You know, of course no. not. Everyone would be extremely excited about that. So, I just don't know why it, it's so hard for people you, to understand it that way. But one thing I, I want to get—I don't want to talk too much here. I want to get your opinion on something else. Going back to Jim Rogers, Drucken Miller, and Buffett. I always use those three as an example of different types of strategies. And I, I think that looking at it from just a strict math standpoint, the reason Buffett has been so successful is because each bet he takes, if you want to look at it, going back to our blackjack conversation the other night, is because it, he, he has high probabilities of each bet uh, panning out and, and actually making money because of, of the, his style. Where if you look at Druckenmiller, I would I don't think he has the, the the probabilities. Obviously, he's got a bit of an edge, but he has just a slight edge, call it a 53%. And I think he'd even admit this, but he has a lot of volume. So you get the law of large numbers on your side, where if you take a bet that's got a 51% chance of winning, but you do it a thousand times in a year, you're, 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 it's, there's a, like a 99.9% certainty that you come out ahead. But if you only place that bet 10 times in a year, 
you, you could very, very uh, easily lose money on that. Then going down to Jim Rogers, he doesn't have anywhere near uh, the probabilities that uh, Warren Buffett would have, has nowhere near the volume. So how does he consistently make money? It's because his bets are just massively asymmetrical. So he may only have 20 or 30 percent winners, but when he's got a winner, it's a, a, a thousand X. It, yeah. It's just, you know, because he's buying real estate in North Korea or, or something like that, you know? Yeah. But I think if Buffett tried to lower his probabilities and do more of a Druck and Miller, if you try to mix and match the, the two or three of them, you're going to you're not going to have the same math and you're not going to do as well long term, if not lose money. And I think and I don't even know that those three guys would would say, yes, that's my strategy. I don't even know if they've ever thought of it that way. But uh, do you have any insight on that? Am I just crazy or am I? Just getting too uh, uh, analytical about it. No, I think it goes back to something that I had said earlier, which is you, you got to know your personality. So, oh, right. so all these guys have a slightly different personality, and they've they've found an investing approach that works for the way that that they're wired. And so, a perfect example is like Buffett. So, what you were describing there, Buffett, he talks about this idea all the time: this margin of safety. So if he thinks that uh, he can go out and value a company, and, and I'm of the opinion that Buffett is using IRR, internal rate of return calculations, in order to, to figure out intrinsic value, Okay. what he's doing is he's, he's going and looking at a company saying, hey, based on the free cash flows I expect this thing to get and the price that the market's offering me, this thing's going to do about a 15% annual return based on how it's priced today. The rest of the market, it's priced at, you know, today it's 2%, but let's just say it was like 5% at the time. So he's giving himself a margin of safety of 10%. So because he's managing so much money, finding something that he thinks is going to outperform the S&P 500 by 10% is a slam dunk win. I need to start acquiring that. So like when he bought Apple three, four years ago, I, when you were looking at those valuations, they were in excess of 10% based on the free cash flows that I was projecting. I wrote a Forbes article about this over three years ago. It has all this math in the Forbes article, I can send you a link for people to kind of read through that so you can understand the math, the methodology that's being used. That's a perfect example where it was it was priced 10 percent better than the S&P 500 at that point in time. And, and I wrote about that. So I'll I'll give you a link to that. So that's Buffett. Right now you got Stan Drunkenmiller. So this guy will literally put on a position. And if for whatever reason, it, the price action just changes and he wakes up the next morning. Yeah. He can change his mind with no emotion whatsoever and say, oh, you know what? I have the exact opposite. Not only was I long before, but now today I'm short. And so how many people can manage their emotions like that and, and change their thesis literally on a 180? And it just shows you how well he can argue both sides of, of a position. Like when he puts a position on, He's making the argument for why he went long, but if you ask him, make an argument for why it's short, he can give you just as much ammunition on why it's short. So there's a guy who just he just functions differently and he does it successfully. I'm of the opinion that he uses a momentum-based approach, like I was describing earlier, where he's looking at volatility of certain particular so like Apple. What's the volatility on Apple? If I had to guess, I would say it's probably um, I would guess probably 20% on an annual basis or somewhere around in there. So when a, when a company is trading inside of that 20% annual volatility range and it breaks that, a guy like Stan Drunkenmiller is saying, there's something different and I'm going to lay on a, a long position or a short position because that price action had a break. Jim Rogers, he's a world traveler. He's going around. He's, he understands how businesses work, right? He's a very smart guy. Used to work for George Soros. Uh, was with George Soros when he made a tank load of money. So he understands that same kind of momentum thing. Uh, he He's a momentum guy as well, very similar to Stan Drunkenmiller, but with a different kind of flavor. He's this international kind of momentum investor. So you see these people and you see how they've been able to marry up their personality with the investing approach that, that fits their personality. Uh, and I think that's really important. So like, if you're not a math person and you're you know, you were an English major in college and you would throw up at the site of a math test. Well, you probably would do better with maybe a momentum strategy or something like that. Right, right. 
Okay, so how do you suggest people figure that out for themselves? I mean, you, you touched on it right there, but do you, do you have any secrets as to how we can know ourselves and say, oh, you know what, I'm this type of person. I should probably start here and, and just maybe try it a little bit. Don't go all in and see if that's right for me. Or do you have an approach where you should just kind of try everything and see what feels most comfortable or, or how did you do that in your own process? You know, I was, um, like I said before, I was, I'm a math guy. So I was really attracted to the Buffett style of investing. And one of the, one of the things that I would tell you is, was a real negative for me with the Buffett style investing was Buffett pretty much openly says that macro is worthless. If you're trying to learn macro, it's just a waste of time. It's, you know, I don't pay any attention to the fed as would be comments that he constantly made. So as a person who empathize with that approach, I took on that exact same, uh, mantra and I would say, I would, I would say the exact same things. Well, I can't, I, I'd be shocked if he said that now. <laughs> I don't think he said, <laughs> is he said well, that the last, you know what? He hasn't commented on it recently. Okay. And I think that, and I think that you're exactly right. I, but uh, my point, I guess, is be careful what you tell yourself. Because yeah. it can be a real setback if you're just saying something because this other guy said it. And I know he's he's not just this other guy. He's one of the greatest investors of all time. But I found uh, my studying of macro. So I I then go to, I learn about Ray Dalio, right? So I go out and I study this other guy who I would argue um, is just as good of an investor and maybe even a better investor but doesn't have as high of a net worth because he blew up 30, 40 years ago. Right. But today I would tell you, I think his approach is actually more balanced than Buffett's approach to investing. Now, a lot of people will argue with that. Right. And that's fine. But my point in saying this is I would have missed out completely on learning about how this other billionaire who is just ridiculously successful that has so much more to offer to an investing approach if I just continued to repeat the Warren Buffett mantra of ignore macro and don't do this. I would tell a person, as you start learning different approaches or you start falling in love with something that you're telling yourself is like your personality, continue to challenge yourself to learn something that is totally outside your comfort zone. Like, uh, I remember when we had Wes Gray, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Patrick's dad, James O'Shaughnessy. James wrote a book, What Works on Wall Street. And on this book, he talks about momentum, he talks about value, and he talks about mixing these two things together. I tell you, he's like the, the founder of that idea of mixing these two strategies together. And it really challenged me as an investor because I was like, you mean to tell me you're just looking at the price action and that's it? Like, that's a bunch of crap. There's no way anybody can invest that way and do it successfully. Well, I was very wrong. I, at least my opinion is I was very wrong about that idea back then. And I'm glad that I had people like that that came on and challenged those ideas. But if I wasn't doing the show and I wasn't, you know, having all these interactions with these brilliant people, I don't know that I would have ever made that leap or, or challenged those underlying assumptions. And so I would challenge people that are hearing this for the first time to really explore, especially the first five years that you're, that you're learning to really step outside your comfort zone and try to learn everything you possibly can from all these yeah. great. They study people that have a proven track record of 20, 30 years in the market that have, you know, a net worth over a hundred million or 500 million. Focus on those people. Don't go listen to somebody who just, you know, and, and here I am as one of those people, but I would tell you, <laughs> focus on, <laughs> focus on, focus on the person who has really accomplished something and then focus on what they've said that they've read. How did they learn what they learned and really kind of go after those things? Where do you think Gunlock fit, fits into this picture here as far as uh, what we've been talking about, his strategy? We, we talked about Buffett, Rogers, Druckenmiller, how they're very unique in their approach, but it works well. I, I got a great intro to that through the market wizards books because they you know each uh interview was so dramatically different but the one thing they all had inconsistent is they matched up their personality exactly what you're saying but how does Gunlock? what's his strategy and uh how does he kind of pull it off is he a hybrid between these guys i know he's more on the the, the debt side on the bond side 
But uh, what's your insights to studying Gunlock? So I would put Bill Gross in there with Gunlock as far as like being okay. known as like the Bond Kings. And I probably have a really unpopular opinion, but you know, this is, this is how I see it. It doesn't mean that it's right. Um, I think bond investors, especially ones that have been managing funds that have specialized in the fixed income market, um, have really kind of just been, it's been a long-term trend since 1981 bond yields have gone down. And it's been in it's been in this trough, right? It's been in this really neat trough that has been highly uh, like the resistance on that trough is never penetrated. And it's so clean, like you can just take a ruler and just draw the line on any any duration. You could look at the 30, the the uh, the 10, the five year, whatever it might be. And you can just draw these lines on the top and the bottom. And I mean, we're, we're talking about momentum. That's what momentum is and what the volatility is inside of those troughs. These guys are, are purely momentum guys that, um, and when you look at how Wall Street works, so much of that money in Wall Street is just being straight pumped into fund managers like a Gunlock and a Bill Gross. Hey, here's a billion dollars. Hey, here's another $5 billion because you did pretty well. You slightly outperformed if I would have just bought the, the 30 year uh, bond. You slightly outperformed that. So I think all these guys are doing is they're just, for since 1981, they've been just drawing that that line. They've been drawing that trough for pretty much every duration, at least for government bonds. And when it's at the top of that trough, they're they're selling. And when they're at the, it's the bottom of that trough, they're buying. And it just keeps being a winning strategy for literally decades on end. When you're looking at the corporate side, they're probably not stepping into. And I don't I don't know this for a fact, but you know, if I was Bill Gross or Jeff Gunlock, I'd be looking at fairly safe bonds, nothing that's in the junk realm. And I'm just looking at a 2% premium above the government ones and, and doing the same exact strategy. So mm -hmm. I think they're more of a, I think they're more of a result of policy that has been very predictable, clear back to 1981 when uh, Volcker basically went, you know, all in and basically was able to to cause the the um, the yields to start coming down, and they noticed that trend early on, and they just continued to ride that trend clear out till today. So they've had a ton of tailwind. Let let me yeah. play devil's advocate. And how much of that tailwind do you think has helped Buffett? Because I mean, stocks obviously tend to do better, should do better in an interest rate environment that's continually going down. So. Would Buffett be Buffett without the, the downtrend in rates since 90, uh, excuse me, since 81? Love the point. And I think it's a very good point because when you start doing valuations on businesses, you realize real fast that the value of everything on the planet goes up when interest rates go down. It's that simple because it's, it's your risk-free rate, right? So as risk-free rates go from 10% down to 7%, the value of everything on the planet goes up. So then when they go from 7% down to 5% and they're at 5% in 2008, 2009 before, or really to the beginning of 2008 before the crash, they're at five, 5.2% 5 on the 10 year treasury. When it goes from 7% to that, well, guess what? The value of everything goes up. And, you know, I was talking with uh, Bill Miller. This was probably a year ago. And, interest rates were, you know, at 2% or whatever. The 10 year treasury was like 2%. And Bill made the comment to me, he goes, Preston, he's like, PE ratios were at 30 back in 2000 when interest rates were, you know, whatever percent. He's like, they're at 2% right now. I don't think 30, a PE of 30 is high when you're looking at it from that context. And what can you say to that? Because he's exactly right. If interest rates have dropped that much. Doesn't well, that assume that interest rates will be there indefinitely? And that it they does. Normalize? It, it absolutely does. But let's, let's walk the dog on that. So do I think central banks are going to allow interest rates to go up right now in the near term? Hell no. They're, I mean, they're talking about yield control, right? So all yield control, control is is central banks stepping in. And buying bonds, notes, whatever, any type of fixed income at any price, yeah. regardless of how many sellers there are. That's what yield control, when they say yield control, that's all that means is they're going to buy anything. 
and they've already proven it. They're stepping into the into the open market and buying ETFs of of junk bonds, which is insane. Like that's not a free and open market. Oh yeah, we it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't had a free market in in this country in, in, or the developed world for I would argue since the late 1980s, and yeah. it's just um, yeah. It but wasn't so, it wasn't as manipulated as post 2008 2000. That's when it that's when the gloves yeah. just came off and it was just like oh, yeah. they weren't fooling anybody at that point. It's just it was just total manipulation after that. But before that, it was much slyer because all they were doing was adjusting the federal funds rate. And it and it's it felt like it was free and open, even though it was slightly manipulated. But after two thousand eight, two thousand nine, dude, it's it's been a total, just total manipulation globally, not just in the U.S. Globally. Yeah, but it's it's going. The trend is up and up and up, right? Like, how do we, how do we get out of this? Like, like how do we reverse everything the Fed has done? So they've taken their balance sheet to 800 billion prior to 2008, goes up to 4 billion, let's say. Now it's up north of 7 billion. And it's, it, it, let's just be realistic. If they're going to do this yield curve control, like you're talking about, and pegging the curve, I mean, the balance sheet of the Fed's going to go 10 trillion, 15 trillion. What if they start buying equities? I mean, where does it end? So, number one, how would they unwind that? And is that even possible? For them to unwind and if it's not uh, possible then what does that mean for the dollar what does that mean for inflation gold bitcoin so this is why i own bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> there so, you go softball so, <laughs> can't use this softball pitch right across the plate <laughs> so you know going back to somebody that i really admire from an investing standpoint ray dalio so ray talks about there's there's four paths that a central bank can can take when they get in this situation where interest rates are at zero percent there's no peg we're completely dealing with fiat currency and interest rates are at zero percent and pretty much across the whole duration they have to start doing quantitative easing and this is this is this is nothing new this has been done throughout time time and time again um read the book uh, this time is different it's uh, we were talking about Bill Gross. This is one of Bill Gross's favorite books. That book probably provides 50 different examples throughout history of this happening time and time again, right? So when you get to 0% interest rates, your money has no peg. You have to start printing. You have to start supplying that liquidity into the system. And you pretty much have two paths to supply that liquidity into the system. You can do it straight into the financial markets by bit by bidding financial asset prices, which is what we've done for 10 years. The other path is to put it straight into the hands of the people that call it helicopter money. Today, they're calling it universal basic income, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. It's the same exact thing as QE. The only difference is, is on the one side, you're, you're bidding the assets. The other side, you're just putting in the hands in the, into the, into the people of, of the economy, the U S citizens, right? If this was Monopoly, and we were, I, I love using the Monopoly ga uh, game as an example for how they can insert the cash because everyone can understand it. If we're talking quantitative easing and I'm the banker and I need to supply more liquidity because there's one person winning the game like, and there's three players that are all losing that are, have no cash flow and have no cash, so I've got to supply more cash into the system so that they all keep playing, right? I can supply it by buying assets from the player that's holding all the that one player who's holding all the assets, and then what do they do? They just start buying the the remaining assets from the other three players, right? Which just right. makes it collapse faster. But but there it is more liquidity. Velocity. It goes back to the M two velocity. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It it does put more liquidity into the system, but it drops the velocity of all of the collective players. My other option is is I can just go to each player and say, here's two hundred dollars. Here's two hundred dollars. Here's hundred. That's UBI helicopter. Man. Those are the two ways I can insert the cash. Now, if we would walk the dog on either one of those scenarios, they both lead to the players in the game getting more upset with playing the game. Because if I just provide $200 to each of the players and they keep going around the board, what happens? What happens? That one player owns all the assets. And so every, every block they land on, they just have to give the $200 to that one person again. Right? right? Then they have no incentive to do any type of labor, right? If we were equating this to the real economy, 
if I just keep giving you money, you're losing more and more incentive to be a productive member of society. Okay. Now, if I, if I do it the other way and I just supply the, the cash to the player who's already winning, that's equally disastrous. This is the whole cotillion yeah. effect, right? That we talk about in the Bitcoin community so much. So both of those scenarios lead to disaster. And so Ray Dalio's point is when you get to an when you get to a situation like this in an economy where there was manipulation to begin with, which caused the polarization of the game, like we didn't allow failure to occur. So that's how you get in these situations. Uh, it, too much manipulation gets you in these situations. So now you have four outcomes that can actually solve the problem. The, 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 the solutions I've talked about are the solutions that they always default to. Central banks always default to those because they, they somehow think that that's going to actually solve it, but it doesn't. It actually makes it worse. You have to either go, and this is Ray's point, you have to make, you have to do austerity, or you have to do debt defaults, or you have to print more money, which is the one I talked about, or you have to redistribute the debt. And so at the end of this, the only way you can really kind of get to the ones that are going to reset the system is you have to have a currency reset. You have to have a new currency that emerges as the desirable uh, currency. And so when I'm looking at this, this situation globally, there's no sound money anywhere. It's not right. like you're going to go to China and they've got sound money or you're going to go over to the euro and they have sound money. Nobody has sound money. And so that's where this is such a unique scenario is globally, there's no sound money. But when you look at something for me, when you look at something like Bitcoin or a lot of people like to say gold um, that has a fixed supply, that's going to be the thing that ultimately resets it. And, and the, one of the reasons I like Bitcoin so much is because I don't I'm not convinced that gold will actually solve the problem. The reason I don't and this is a very controversial opinion that I have that I don't think very many people have. The reason I don't think gold will solve the problem is because gold didn't solve the problem from 1944 to 1971. We, whether people want to believe this or not, we had an inflationary monetary policy from 1944 up to 1971. The reason we had an inflationary monetary policy, even though we were on a gold standard, is because you still had a trusted agent in the loop that was, that was adjusting the money multiplier, which was a thing that just disappears after you don't have sound money or quote unquote sound money anymore, but they were able to exercise an inflationary monetary policy by adjusting this money multiplier. They were able to increase the money supply by just saying, well, you used to be able to come to the bank and give me $1 for an ounce of gold. Well, then it became $4 for one ounce of gold. Then it became $20 for one ounce of gold. And so as you're adjusting that money multiplier, what happens is, is you're actually debasing the money. You're actually implementing an inflationary monetary policy because there's a human in the loop looking at the ledger of, of gold sitting in, in the bank account or sitting in the, the vault versus how much currency and fiat money is in circulation. If you're adjusting that ratio, you're still having an inflationary monetary policy. The, the peg is in by name only, okay, where I think this is the first time in history we're in a situation where we might actually have sound money globally that can't be debased because there's no human in the loop. And what I, what I also think is fascinating about this time in, in this massive big debt cycle that we're in that Ray Dalio talks about endlessly yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off, Preston, but that yeah. was one of my questions. So his long-term yeah. debt cycle, you're you're a firm believer in that, because I think that's playing out. You know, you look at the long-term and the short-term within those, but you see us being right at the tail end of that long-term no debt cycle he always describes. No doubt. And I, if, yeah. if anyone wants to see it graphically, just pull up the 10-year treasury and look at it from 1940 till now, and you'll see this perfect, you know, uh, mountain-shaped curve of, of yield um, where you saw it hit 16% in 1981, and it's come straight down. And, and from 1940s up until 1981, it went straight up, and then it went straight back down. So you can see, you can graphically see this long-term debt cycle and how we're at the end of it. And where I think, going back to the Bitcoin piece, and uh, you know Jeff Booth talks about, well, what's the implications? What happens when we have an inflationary monetary policy for eight decades? Because that's what I think we've had it is 
literally since, you know, eight decades, we've had an inflationary monetary policy. I think what it does is it creates this massive, massive incentive structure for capital investment, for technological advancement. And Jeff Booth's argument is we're now moving so quickly that the only thing that can slow this down with technology outstripping uh, humanity's ability to, to keep pace with it is to have a deflationary monetary policy. And I think the only way you could possibly have that is with Bitcoin. That's the only technology that I see that could supply it. I don't think going back on a gold standard is going to supply a deflationary monetary policy. I think if we went back on, let's just assume all these governments can somehow get along Okay, yeah, big assumption, right. real big assumption. Let's assume that they can all of a sudden get along and we stand up a new uh, monetary, global monetary standard off of a gold standard. They're going to go straight back to an inflationary monetary policy by the debasement of that right. based off of like what I described earlier from 1940s to 1971. They're going to do the exact same thing, which means we still have an inflationary monetary policy. We still have the incentive structure for technology to keep trucking at a breakneck pace outstripping humanity's ability to even handle it. So it's, it's an exciting but concerning because it has major, massive implications that if Bitcoin would stand up as a, as a global currency, what it would do to the debt market is somewhat unfathomable, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, right. It, I mean, it's, it's unfathomable because at that point, uh, anybody who's issued debt... They're not getting uh, what they're getting back in return is is a total pittance. I mean, it's 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 a total impairment for anybody yeah, that's. Yeah, it's that. almost like you, you do like a debt jubilee because the central banks own so much of the the debt that they just kind of forgive it and transfer to a whole new monetary system that people might have more confidence in because that debt jubilee would probably ruin the the confidence in the whatever was, you know, whether it's dollars or reserve currency or anything like that. So that makes a lot of sense. Go, go ahead, Preston. I'm well, sorry. So think of it like this. For just anybody off the street, let's say they just went and bought a house for $300,000 and they pretty much financed the whole thing. That mm -hmm. contract is denominated in fiat dollars. Right. right they are going right. to pay, like in the contract, the contract they signed with that bank is an agreement that I will pay you back in fiat dollars. If we move to a new currency that is much more desirable and it gets realized, like that debasement that we all know is happening, gets realized through the pricing relative to this other currency, the person who borrowed that money is going to be happy to pay that back, right? They're going to be real happy to pay that back because all they're doing is they're holding that new currency and the one that they're making the payments for, that, that, that contract that's denominated in fiat, it's getting the base at 20%, whatever percent a year. And they're, they're paying 2% to interest on it. Right. So they're netting 18% annually if, if those would be the numbers. Right. Um, and so I don't think very many people in the world are thinking about what that impact would be. And so when we go and we look at Ray Dalio's four things that reset the economy, redistribution of debt, debt defaults are two of those components. Bitcoin supplies that in a major, massive, unprecedented way on a global scale. So if you're somebody who's issuing debt right now at 3%, 2% interest in fiat, and the contract says you're going to get paid back in fiat, boy, oh boy, you better be ready for it. Because mm. it is not going to be a fun experience. Yeah, what an interesting point, man. Uh, I, I really appreciate it, Preston. This has been just such an interesting, cool, cool conversation. I, I, I cannot wait to do this again, buddy. For all my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, your podcast, where should they go for that? So if you uh, go on iTunes and just type in We Study Billionaires, we just we try to follow all the smartest people in the market, the you know the Jeff Gunlocks, the Ray Dalios, the Warren Buffetts, and Anytime those guys are putting hints out there as to what's going on or what it might be, we're trying to talk about it on the podcast. So if you want to check that out or you want to hit me up on Twitter, my name's Preston Pish. Uh, love interacting with people on Twitter. And George, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you tonight. Oh, it was, it was awesome. Thanks for your time again, Preston.